My name is Tiana Nakia McLaughlin. My good friend uh, and collaborator, Danielle Detweiler, um, who I've been in a lot of conversations with, told me that, you know, like kind of randomly, she's like, you should think about making a play. I took it very serious and started to think about what I had around me um, of interest. And with Dummy, I'm thinking about an object that isn't a violent object only because of what is projected on it by a human form or mind or person. In understanding the architecture of the space and understanding like what this time would mean and where I was, I already knew that the head gates would have to be a reflection of not only, um, I guess, London, but thinking about the agriculture and the rural area around that. Coming into this space, the opportunity to acquire these head gates that are situated within the UK and Europe spoke back to me because I came with of course, an interest in focusing on the bend, looking for aspects of mercy, and was confronted with very little mercy um, within the object, which I found very intriguing. I think that the head gates deal with a, a psychological violence, the naming head gate, dealing with the head of the animal, um, a certain kind of control of the head, the Mercy is uh, the only Toni Morrison book that comes out when I am of age and that I go and see her and have her sign the book. In the last paragraph, there is a um, delivery on ideas of dominion. It says, understand me, there is, there is no protection. There was nothing in the catechism to tell them no. Then again, it says there is no protection. And then again, there is no protection, but there is difference. So in that reread, especially with my handling of the head gates, it really resonated as a mantra for how they exist. Because the statement with the objects is that there is no protection. There is a system that these head gates operate within. The only thing that happens is the difference in how harsh or you know, less brutal they are. So that's a mercy. With Jean Genet, a different thing happened. I read the book. I didn't like it. And then I went back and read, I started to read it again because I was like, I was trying to check myself. So I was almost doing a rereading again. And I read the prompt that I overlooked in the beginning because I just thought it was like, you know, I was just like, let me get to it. And then that prompt, I read it. And then I was like, this prompt is everything. You know, when he says, if the black refuse the mask, then let a dummy be used. And I, I said, I was like, dummies forever. Like, I was like, immediately desired a dummy. And I wanted a dummy because I, at that moment, felt immense use. The reason why I tend to have such a tactile relationship to my work and I make like my own work um, in a very demanding way. A lot of artists make their own works. Um, but in my case, I don't have an assistant. I rarely use um, help um, unless it's something that's a safety issue. Because I use ready-made objects, people assume that they have less of a, a handling, that they come ready. And my thing is that they, they have that, but there's a whole relationship that I'm trying to engage to prepare them, to clean them, to restore them, or to deteriorate them that is like part of the work. Um, and it's just something that I've decided, like it's not enough to just get it and just put it on the wall. I got to get it and there has to be an intervention or something that I'm doing to check it um, to kind of correct it or change it to make it mine. So I want the audience to immediately have to be challenged with their um, positionality. Uh, I don't know how often that gets to happen um, in this space. So it's something that I wanted to happen where I made the audience immediate complicit and kind of challenge notions of consent, you know, like you step in a room and you're on the stage, you can't get off that stage unless you get out the room type thing. The use of leather in my practice um, is something that was very important for this presentation to hold. And this is before I knew that this actual building is in the center of what used to be the leather market of London.
so it's added plus. The paint that I use for these paintings is white grease paint. It's used by theater um, actors, uh, especially when they want to kind of give the illusion or really kind of extend like the appearance of whiteness. And on the stage, because you're playing these characters where color may mean something, and it doesn't have to be around race, it could be a clown, it could be um, any kind of weird figure. So this originates from old time theater. It really works well with leather because leather is skin. And in this case, I didn't want any marks on my leather. And so I had to find and source these um, really, really uh, fine, like kind of pure untouched leather hides and come up with the equal height and bigness that I can get out of them. So the paintings are of these masks worn by these characters in the Jean Genet's play, The Court, that are figured as The Court, which are Black actors who wear these white masks that are figured after African masks. And I was very interested in those figures because they are all about emotion. And they're all about judging everyone, like everyone, people on the stage and the audience. And then the process was taking them one by one and applying the paint. And there's about seven to eight layers of that paint because the paint starts big, it falls by the next day. And so to build it up even to that low level was about like, I guess like two weeks of work. The white grease paint is set with baby powder, which is an odd material because they do have setting powder, just like for, you know, makeup. But baby powder um, in this form, it works well in the sense that it is something that absorbs the oil. So it kind of helped me like set it and actually get it closer to a clay-like or a ceramic appearance. Um, but yeah, the way it sits in the, the installation is that they, they judge the audience and the dummy. One of the things that I um, wanted to think about in thinking of doing a, a solo presentation here in London um, is to bring in the, the biggest influence that I have from the city has been theater. And I'm a huge fan of Shakespeare, but I'm also a huge fan on the other end of these hyper like experimental, more like modern presentations of uh, plays that defy and challenge ideas of what a play can be. And so I spent um, a year straight going to plays. What that did for me was give me an opportunity to look at formal cues of how to deal with space. Um, and, and then how I could bring that into an exhibition space, but also think about my own play. So I have missable sounds in both installations. The sound pops up in the room every seven minutes, and it's just basically her going in order of the time of how that there is no protection shows up in the last chapter. When I thought of an um, actor I that, that felt that could hold the gravity of this space, I um, immediately thought of Noma Dumaswini. The way that it sits in the room is that it is something that startles, but it also is something that immediately settles you down. Understand me. There was no protection and nothing in the catechism to tell them no. For Dummy, I immediately knew that I wanted Sophie Okaneda. Um, and I knew that that was a very big goal uh, and a very big impossible kind of undertaking. Uh, but it was a good thing to put up in terms of desire for who would you want to work with um, in this strange, like, one act, one page, bizarre play where it doesn't require any movement and it has to be something that is enough to make you feel something for this object. And so Sophie um, uh, recorded uh, my um, monologue in three different styles. And one of the things I wanna share is that she actually, when, she, when I first gave her the prompt of reading the dummy through like melancholic restraint, wounded rage and defiant pride, one of the first things that she said to me was that actors, and she said specifically her, she's like, we don't generally perform an emotion. We perform something that is towards this thing. And it kind of put me back and I had to go write 
prompts for each one. And then for Melancholic Restraint, uh, the dummy that's on view now, um, that one was really, really uh, powerful because it's the dummy that I've chosen to perform for the exhibition in this iteration. Um, and it's an extension of how I feel right now. So I'm basically asking someone to perform how I feel right now. Over here. Yeah. Over here, look. Um, if you're looking for a show, it's not here. That's for sure. It would be best if you didn't make it through such a ruin. So, I sit here, quietly, ruinous. I just want you to be able to see, to appear to stand in for us both. I will never get hurt. Don't you see this? I will always show up for you. For me, never late, always on time. I take the hit, you get strong, repeat. There is no pity for me. I started off as a um, person who was very invested in film that I still chase in my um, artistic practice now. I'm actually doing probably wilder stuff here that I was trying to do in the film um, world. Um, but in this space, I think it helped me actually maintain the desire that I have, which is the core element of film, which is how to kind of create an experience. You know, the world building of it is something that I think I've gotten better um, at in all these years. Every, every exhibition that I make, I think of as a film, every single one. Dummy is probably the closest thing that I've made towards like film. <laughs> it's like giving people a glimpse of like how I'm thinking um, and, and what I hope to bring over into that space. Some of these elements that I've learned how to work out objects as character and things like that. Um, my motivation for making work is really trying to figure out every time how to um, make a statement about where I'm at. <laughs>